Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Middlesex University Summer Success Camp. Um, welcome to day two. We had a really nice uh, session um, on day one with uh, the games design course that's so going to be taking place in the next 15 minutes. Um, but until then, uh, I'm just going to take you through a few things um, to do with the course and how we're running things. Um, I'm going to give you another couple of minutes just for a few more people to come and sign in and subscribe to the web page. So um, just, uh, just hold tight for a little bit longer um, and I'll be back in a minute. Okay, hello again, everyone. Welcome to day two of the Middlesex Summer Success Camp. Um, I'm hoping that quite a few of you came on for the Monday session, but um, if not, don't worry. All of our sessions are recorded and live on our YouTube page. So if you do miss anything, you are able to go back and have a look anytime. Okay, so let's just move on to today's program. All right, so at 9.45, directly after this short welcome, um, we're going to have a desi game design session with Michael from uh, Digital Schoolhouse. Um, today's session with him is called Jazzy Jigsaws, um, and it's a review um, of the problem solving involved within the jigsaw puzzle and how this relates to programming. Um, for those that were here on Monday, uh, I'm sure that you um, got involved with the, the problem solving to do with, with programming and it was an unplugged session that was really, really engaging um, and it was a really, really good introduction to games design and programming. Um, then we're going to have a short break for about half an hour um, and this uh, session today, rather than English on Monday, this one's going to be maths um, and it's going to be centred around um, mathematical language and the probability scale. Um, and it's going to be delivered by um, Iram, who's, um, she's a great teacher from um, LCC Learning, um, and she's going to be doing that probability scale with you guys. Um, and then after lunch, um, what we're going to do in this session is it's going to be a bit of a catch up um, and questions with the middle, Middlesex team. So I'll be there um, and one or two of my colleagues will be there too. To, uh, to take any questions that you might have. Um, and also, if you might have missed um, anything on Monday or this morning, um, or to catch up with some of the work that, that's been set for you. So I know that Chocolate Films, uh, there was a, a, in the film session, they've asked you to come up with a concept for your short film that you're gonna be making and, and to even write a script. Um, and so far, some of you have, have submitted the scripts and we're really, really impressed with some of the work that's been submitted. Okay, um, so that's, that's going to be today. Um, so yeah, at, digi at 9.45, um, Digital Schoolhouse. So Michael's going to be delivering um, the, the session at 9.45. 
And then we've got Iram session at 11.15 to do with probability. And as always, um, I'm sure most of you were here um, on Monday, but some of you might not have been. So what we need you to do um, is we need you to go in the next nine minutes, we need you to go over to menti.com um, and type in 30, 58, 64. And what that will do will allow you to put your name and your school name just so we know that you're here, okay? We know that you're, you're engaging and you're present because there are a lot of really, really cool uh, prizes that we have got for this summer success camp. Um, so it's going to be... Um, it's going to be linked to 10 you're going to get a prize and some of the prizes are really really cool okay some of the prizes are um to do uh, we've got footballs t-shirts sunglasses we have got um a scuba diving experience for you and a par parent or guardian um we've got ps4 games we've got gift boxes we've got lots and lots of really really exciting prizes so make sure you go to menti.com and type in your name and your school okay um the next thing that you can do in menti.com also is you'll be able to ask us questions in the q a so uh, once you've typed in your your name and your school name we will change the slides so you guys will be able to ask us questions and last on monday there were loads of really really exciting engaging questions that you that you asked and and we want you to keep continuing to do that please that was really really useful for us and for the teachers too okay um just to remind you i know you're watching through youtube now but if everyone could subscribe to the to, to the youtube channel that will make our lives easier and your lives easier too so let's make sure we all subscribe to the youtube channel if possible um i talked a little bit earlier about um submitting work and we had some really really impressive submissions from you guys um we had some amazing pictures drawn in the game design um, session. We had a couple of really, really um, engaging stories um, and really showed really great creative writing, um, which was really impressive. And we've had a couple of scripts already. Um, um, so if you need to upload any, any work, then please go to this link here. Um, it's gonna be under, it's gonna be underneath the video today. Um, but this is the link here the, for the Dropbox. So you can drop any work um, in there and that's going to be open all day. So before we start again, I'm going to um, just let you go off to menti.com um, and type in 30, 58, 64. Um, and we're going to be starting with Michael in five minutes time so go off and um, type in that code into menti write your name and your school name and then we're going to start the session at 9 45.
just going to remind anyone, um, just for anyone that's just joined us, to go over to menti.com um, and type in 305864 and type in your name um, and your school name. Um, and in about 10 minutes, you'll be able to ask us some questions. Okay? Thank you very much. And a couple of people say that they haven't been able to log into the Mentimeter. So why don't you just try again now? Um, it should be working now. Okay, so 30, 58, 64. Thank you very much. Just before we start again, just to make, make sure that everyone goes over to menti.com before they start and, and types in 30, 58, 64, and types in the school name and the name. You can do this at any point throughout the session. So if you're if you're worried about doing this second, and don't worry too much, but definitely make sure you do it just so you can be in with a chance of winning all those cool prizes, and so you can ask us questions, and so we know you're there. Okay. Um, so yeah, if you can go over and do that uh, in the next few minutes, um, and then Michael from Digital Schoolhouse is going to start the session. Okay, uh, I'm going to begin. Um, I'm hoping that the screen will come over to me whilst I'm speaking to you guys. Is that going to happen? Okay, guys, I'm going to begin with, uh, it's just gone uh, quarter to 10 in the morning. Can I say good morning to everybody uh, that's here? Um, I'm just hoping that as I speak, uh, the system will recognize that I'm talking and therefore bring a, 
bring the camera over to my screen. It's not done so yet. Um, fair enough. I'll start by sharing my screen, actually. Let's come back to this. All right, I'm just going to crack on and we'll see how it goes, guys. Okay, I'm hoping that you guys will be able to see me this morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Michael. I'm on behalf of Digital Schoolhouse, and I'm excited to talk to you today about jazzy jigsaws, um, which really isn't just about jigsaw puzzles, but actually about how you can solve problems, uh, you know, in a computing environment, how you can solve problems when gaming, um, and actually what types of applications we have for solving problems and puzzles whilst gaming, and actually more widely, uh, how we can solve problems in our lives. Um, since studying and becoming good at computing and different techniques within computing, I found all sorts of things in my own personal life quite easy to solve and problems quite easy to fix uh, because I've learned a, a certain apparatus or a certain set of skills that have enabled me to do so. I'm hoping uh, after today's session, I'll be able to teach you guys some of those skills that you will be able to walk away from, be that either with regards to computer game development and design, uh, be that with regards to playing your own computer games or uh, be that just towards general things in your own lives. So let's hope that happens today. Uh, what I'm going to talk to you guys today about is fundamentally the cornerstones of computer science, which is to learn about computational thinking, okay? So how we can think more computationally, uh, meaning how can we think in a way that aligns our thinking more closely to the way that our computers work? Uh, if you were here for Monday's session, or if you need to catch up, you can go to the channel and have a look for Monday's session. We spoke about how the partnership between human beings and computers is a is a fantastic partnership because as human beings, we are very intelligent, but sadly very slow. Uh, the opposite can be said for computers. They are unintelligent, but incredibly fast at calculations. And by computationally thinking, we can actually start linking uh, the ways in which we might solve problems ourselves with the ways in which our computers can solve problems. So it really is that bridge between our computer and ourselves. Uh, the second learning objective today is to understand the three methods of thinking computationally. Uh, these three methods we'll talk about in more detail, but this is a decomposition, uh, which you guys may have heard about with regards to perhaps food or cellular structures in science. Uh, we're gonna talk about abstraction, uh, which you guys may have heard about in art, for example, and uh, pattern recognition, which is something that uh, more closely relates perhaps to maths that you guys may have come across before. Um, one of the fantastic things about computing is that it, it pulls from all of these different areas of, of expertise and these schools of thought. And really, we're expected as computer scientists to start linking them all up together. So decomposition, abstraction and pattern recognition are the three different methods we're going to learn about today in thinking computationally. And then we're going to apply some of those computational thinking methods to solving a jigsaw puzzle, or at least use the jigsaw puzzle as a means by which we can talk about how we might go about solving problems is more of a metaphor for us, okay? So getting started, guys, what is computational thinking? Well, there's all sorts of people that um, have all sorts of different thoughts and uh, feelings about what thinking computationally is. Um, but fundamentally, it's the ability to think logically about a problem and apply techniques for solving it. So I said earlier that um, obviously logical thinking, rational thinking, we hear all of these words often and all the time. But what is specifically useful for us uh, with regards to these sessions is thinking computationally. So it's how those things link to the tools that we've equipped ourselves with through hardware and software in computational machines. OK, um, just a lovely quote here by um, G G Jeanette M. Wing, Vice President and Head of Microsoft Research International, uh, computational thinking involves solving problems, designing systems, and understanding human behavior. And by drawing on these concepts fundamental to computer science, okay? So again, guys, if the gaming industry is something that grabs you or something that you're potentially excited about, understanding how to think computationally is absolutely vital. If you're creating a computer game, you can never forget that the player is at the center of that design process. And if you're making a fantastic world of fantasy world or, or puzzle game or action game or anything like that, what well, you have to keep central to all of your development and design ideas 
is that it's the human being, your player, that is going to play your game. And how can you link what you're doing on that computer to what that player is going through in their own real life experiences? Um, and these are things that the computer science endeavors to try and link better together to, to reduce this divide between the computer and the human being. So let's get started straight away with thinking computationally, guys. Let's have a look at abstraction, okay? Um, fundamentally, the way that we consider abstraction, if you have any pen and paper with you today, that'd be fantastic. Um, actually, just a warning ahead of time, make sure you have got some pen and paper for today's session because we are gonna be doing some, some work. Um, just going back to session one on Monday, uh, I've been able to have a look at some of the work that was uploaded uh, that you guys did and I was absolutely overjoyed by what I saw. I saw some absolutely fantastic uh, drawings of, of, for example, the, the flower power from Super Mario, et cetera. Uh, I saw some really awful ones as well. I'm not gonna pull any names, but they made me laugh. So thank you for, thank you for that. Um, the same way today, guys, it would be absolutely fantastic if you guys can make sure you've got some pen, pens or a pencil uh, and some paper so that at the end of today's session, uh, on the YouTube link, you'll be able to find uh, in the in the description a, a link to the Dropbox where you can then upload your piece of work, and I'll be able to have a good look at that. Um, I'm hoping today nothing's going to make me laugh because hoping just to see some fantastic plans from your thinking computationally today. But we'll 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 get more into that later. Okay. So anyway, coming back to abstraction, guys, it's a way of separating the important information out of the detail of something. Okay. So fundamentally, when there is a problem. Uh, we don't need to know all of the details of the problem, okay? We don't necessarily need to know every single minute or minuscule issue related to a particular problem. We just need the facts. We need people sometimes to cut to the chase and we need to be able to work with just the facts that permit themselves to that particular problem in order for us to solve it. Uh, and we can talk about that more in depth shortly. I just want us to think about the word abstraction. I said that you may have seen this in art. Uh, this is an abstract girl with a yellow hat uh, by Pablo Picasso. You may have heard of him. Um, abstraction, why is this abstract? If we are gonna say in the previous slide that abstraction is a way of separating the important information out of the detail of something, then in what ways might you guys consider uh, that this is a form of abstraction. Uh, what would be absolutely fantastic for me, guys, if you could, is go to your menti.com where you've just logged in uh, with the code 30, 58, and 64, and, and just have a think about and see if you can make a comment on any of these, any of these questions here. If this is an abstract image, uh, does this image have much detail? Is this a detailed piece of artwork? Is this something that you could compare to, say, for example, uh, the, the image of Mona Lisa? Um, is this as detailed as the Mona Lisa? And if not, uh, what effect does that have? What, what's missing from this if it's not as detailed as the Mona Lisa? Um, is it including all of the things you'd normally expect to see on a person? Uh, so, for example, just me looking at this abstract girl, I can see, yeah, a pair of eyes that looks like a pair of nostrils for her nose. Uh, there's a mouth, there's, there's a hand, it's got four fingers and it looks like a thumb. Hair? Uh, yes, she looks like she's wearing a yellow hat of some sort. Um, so yeah, I, I think I am seeing all the things I'd normally expect to see on a person, but what detail has been ignored here? What things are missing from this image? And does it matter? Does it make this image good because things are missing or does it make this image bad because these things are missing? Well, this depends on your own point of view of art. Is this art? That's a big question. When we discuss abstraction, what we're thinking about is removing information that might be unnecessary for us. Arguably, this image that we can see here is a mess. Okay, this is a mess. But it wouldn't be that difficult for every single person that looks at it to say that that is a girl uh, perhaps with the earring, the red lipstick, the long hair, and look, what looks like it could be a dress, um, <clears throat> wearing a yellow hat. She's got this yellow thing around the top of her head. It looks like a hat. That's, it's not difficult to say that this is an abstract girl with a yellow hat. But fundamentally, if you saw someone looking like that in the street, you'd be shocked. Okay. Let's have a look at this one instead. Uh, if for those of you, I imagine a few of you will recognize this image. Um, 
What is it? What is this image? Uh, is it detailed? Um, do we do we see all of the things on it that we'd normally expect to see if we were at this place in person? So for those of you that are unsure, this is a, uh, a screenshot from a section of the London Underground map. So the Underground uh, Rail Network. <clears throat> and um, essentially, this is a this is a map that would help commuters, uh, you know, plan their travel from one particular uh, station or destination to the next. <clears throat> but what's missing? Because I've been to London, guys, and London does not look like that. London is not a white area with big white black outlined dots and lots of multicolored lines going between them with huge Regent's Park, Bond Street, Tottenham Court Road labels all over the place. Okay. This is an abstracted image of London. In fact, because the purpose of this image has been only to help commuters on planning at what station they begin, at what direction they may want to travel, on what coloured line they want to travel on, and the number of stops they may wish to travel before they then get off at a particular station, we've ignored almost everything else about London. All of the buildings, all of the streets, all of the cars, all of the people, all of the trees, they're gone. They're not there. Where are the landmarks? They're not there. We've abstracted only the necessary information to help us solve the problem. Our commuters want to travel across London. They do not need to know how many trees they passed on getting from King's Cross to Oxford Circus. They only need to know the number of stops and the general direction that they need to travel in, as well as the color of the line that they need to travel on. And that is why that's what this map shows. It shows not all of the detail and fantastic, exciting things that are going on in London every single day. It shows only the information that these commuters need. And again, this is a form of abstraction, We're taking away any unnecessary information so that we have only the important or necessary information left over. So moving on to the second um, kind of item of thinking computationally or one of the cornerstones of computer science that would help any games developer or designer really break in and understand what they're doing is called decomposition. And it's on decomposition that we're going to take some time to actually go through some examples and it's through decomposition that we can really learn to be effective problem solvers. Now, procedural decomposition means breaking a problem into a number of subproblems so that each subproblem accomplishes an identifiable task. Now, that doesn't sound very uh, user friendly to me. That sounds actually still quite complex. Well, let's think about what decomposition might mean in nature. Uh, if you were to have a loaf of bread that's gone off, that has begun to decompose, or perhaps in a uh, in organisms and cellular structures, uh, if things are left dead for a long enough period of time, they will begin to decompose, which means that their cell structure begins to break down into smaller parts. Now, the exact same thing here in computing, we're talking about decomposition because we're talking about recognizing a complex problem can be broken down into smaller parts that are easier to solve. Now, this principle of solving problems is fundamental to anybody that works in the computing industry and is useful to anybody that works in any industry. And like I said at the beginning, can help us in our own personal lives uh, to be able to uh, more adequately solve problems. Okay. Um, so let me just try something. I want to, I'm not sure if you guys can see me on, on the camera guys. I'm, not 100% certain if that's working. Uh, perhaps it is, and I'm just staring at you a bit blankly as I do this. Oh, brilliant, okay. No, we, we, can, we can see you, Michael. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. Sorry, I was just a little bit confused because it's um, I, I can't see me on it, but that's fine. You guys can see me, fantastic. Um, I'm just going to come back to the share screen, guys, but fundamentally, moving forwards, we're now going to do some activities on breaking problems down in order to solve them. And this is a fundamental skill 
not only if you're interested in going into the gaming or computing industries, but for anything that you do in your lives, these are one of the most core or useful skills that you can learn. Okay, so coming back to my screen, let's have a look. Let's have a look at this car. So actually, at the moment, I'm in the market for buying a car. Uh, this isn't the one that I'm going to go for, but I thought this was a nice image of decomposition. Uh, this is the part on the website where you can design uh, the type of car that you'd like to purchase or order from the manufacturer and they'll produce it. Now, to say that I would like a 1.2 turbo diesel injection, 17-inch um, wheels, metallic black with a leather red detailed interior with all of the extras would be very difficult for me to ring up and for somebody to interpret that and understand exactly what car I want. I'm still being quite vague because cars are incredibly complex and there's lots of different specifications that you can get for a car. On this particular website, what it does is it enables me to build my car and I can go to the engine section where I can then choose which specification of engine I'd like for this car. I can then go to wheels where I have a whole selection of different wheels that I can choose from. I then go to paint and choose which paint job I'd like on it after. I can then choose different features for my interior, go on to any extras that I want to add on to that particular car, and then I can have a look at the overview of that car as well. What this does, guys, it takes the very complex uh, problem of actually ordering a very tailored and bespoke car for myself and breaks it down into all of the different subsections of all the different choices that I've got to make to make that tailored car. Decomposition is something that's done all the time and it makes things very easy, especially in this case where uh, I think his Volkswagen wants me to spend £30,000 of my money. It makes the process of me spending £30,000 super, super easy. Um, let's have a think about a complex problem, okay? Um, for example, let's have a think about how we would build a game of Super Mario. Now, Super Mario is one of the most successful computer games ever made. And fundamentally, it's quite simple, isn't it? You run about, you jump on things, and you get to the end of the level, and hopefully you save Princess Peach at the end. But fundamentally, guys, it is not a simple task for any game designer or developer to create. This is a complex task. This is a multifaceted complex, very large project if we were to embark on it to create a game of Super Mario. And for those of you that have dabbled and had a play at making your own computer games, you'll know that is very true. Uh, there's lots and lots of different elements to what makes a whole game of Super Mario. What we're going to do, if given the task of making a game of Super Mario, we're going to divide and break up the task into manageable pieces. That way, we can actually go on to design and develop a game that can make us billions and billions and billions of pounds. So let's have a look. Here we go. And what we do, guys, when thinking through decomposition, we're going to start at the top. And what we're thinking of here in this case is a Super Mario. OK, that is what we would like to create. What we then have to think about is how we can break Super Mario down into uh, subsections or smaller parts to think about, you know, how is this game structured and how is this game made? Well, fundamentally, I could suggest that there's four main sections of this game, okay? There's the menu sections in which we give uh, the player control of when they begin the game, at what point they might begin the game, at what levels they want to play. We have the rules of this game. Uh, the rules of a game of Super Mario is essentially get to the finish line, uh, don't die along the way, uh, try to collect some coins or points, or do it in a good amount of time. Um, also, in order to achieve those set of rules, we need to have controls. We need to give the human being the ability to make that impact. Um, and also, in order for any of these things to make sense to the human being, we have to display those on the screen using computer graphics. And hopefully we're using computer graphics that are appealing and that people enjoy. So let's break that down even further. And I hope that you can see on that transition, guys, that I've gone from having just a menu rules, controls and graphics to having the same menu rules, controls and graphics, except this time I've broken each of those down into subsections as well. So for example, I know that within the menu, I just need to have a start button uh, in order to start the game. And perhaps we need a pause button in order to be able to pause the game. And these are two of the controls that we have over the game as a whole. Uh, like I mentioned before, as far as the rules are concerned, we're gonna have timed levels and we're gonna have a number of lives of which we need to stay within in order to complete uh, our objectives. 
controls. Well, there's fundamentally only a few controls for Mario, which is a nice, simple one for us to design. There's movement, there's jumping, and there's actions. For example, spinning the cape or, or shooting a fire, a fireball after you obtain a fire flower. And finally, there's the graphics of the game, okay? There's sprites, which refers to the moving characters normally, or the moving elements of your environments. Um, we have the level itself, which is often made up as a, a, of a number of blocks within a game of Super Mario. And we have the animations and the way in which these things actually move through different frames of this game. So what we're doing, guys, now is getting a clearer understanding of how Super Mario is made, because we're dividing it into subsections and dividing those into subsections so that what we have, hopefully, at the end, are very small parts that we need to design. Now, again here, guys, you can see uh, that I have then expanded a little bit further on the controls of Super Mario. The rest is the same, except the control section has got ever so slightly more uh, divulged. Uh, I've looked at what jumping actually is. Well, when we think about jumping as Super Mario in a game, essentially we press a button, Mario moves up the screen, uh, he then slows down, he then comes to a full stop in midair, he then begins to move down and then comes to a full stop once he hits the ground. Um, I think that anybody that's built a platforming game can say they've made the mistake of failing to program the event where a character actually hits the ground. Uh, I've built a game similar to Super Mario, a platforming game, where my character effectively jumps, but then he comes down and goes through the floor and carries on for infinity. And it's always really important to recognize, guys, as human beings in the real world, we do stand on a ground that stops us from falling through the floor, and we need to do the same when designing computer games. Um, fundamentally, guys, movement's quite simple. Mario can move left and right. Jumping dictates his up and down movements, but fundamentally, left and right are the two inputs that we'd use in order to get Mario to go up and down. Uh, unless perhaps talking about water or flying level. And then uh, finally, guys, action is where these things get a little bit more complex, but some of the actions that we can perform with Super Mario normally by holding down the B button would be to shoot a fireball, to spin your cape, or to sprint, or use any other group of different actions as well. I've not listed all of them, but I've listed some of them. Now, what we've done here, guys, is decomposition. Now, how does this help? If you're looking at this thinking, okay, this hasn't become more easy. This has actually become more complex now. Building a game of Super Mario isn't easier. Uh, I'd have to disagree. This is now an easy task because all I'm going to try to achieve today, if I was to go, go away and build a game of Super Mario, I'm going to try to build the start menu. And that's all. And actually that start menu might take me until the end of this week, but I can build that start menu. I feel that's within my capabilities to build. And once that start menu is complete, I might build a pause function in the game. I might then actually have to go away and have a look at the graphics and start actually designing all the sprites and level animations. Okay. Once I've got all of those, perhaps I can then start putting the level design together. Maybe once I've got the level design and I've got my sprite of Mario, maybe I'm looking at maybe two weeks away from now, I can then stick... Mario on there and press left and right and see if I can get that character to move across the screen. So what I've done guys, is I've taken a really complex task like Super Mario and broken it down into its core elements. And sometimes we refer to these as leaves at the bottom of this, uh, these branches. These leaves are much easier to make. Whereas the actual whole branch of Super Mario is actually a very, very difficult thing to create. Now this happens in the gaming industry all the time. When we're looking at modern games, like Super Smash Brothers or Call of Duty or anything like that, we are looking at teams of hundreds and hundreds of experts working, each specializing in a different area of these types of breakdowns, which means by decomposing a large problem like creating a really good and modern computer game, we can start to break those modern computer games down into subsections, which enable us to better either organize our own workload or to organize a team's workload. So this is how decomposition can help us to solve problems. It makes the problems manageable bite size. What I'd like us to do now, guys, is have a little bit of a, uh, actual activity. So I asked you guys to get some pen and paper. I'd like us to actually uh, apply and demonstrate the idea of applying this set of skills to defeating a particular boss on a computer game. Now, what I'm gonna do, guys, is just stop sharing my screen. And um, instead of sharing uh, the video of me here, I'm actually gonna come down to uh, my paper so that I can kind of work through this with you at the same time. Now, the objective here, and what I'd like you guys to do 
at home if you can. Uh, again, if you don't have any pen and paper available, uh, I know I saw some work from Monday's session where you guys had opened up Paint and you'd simply done your designs within Paint on a computer. Absolutely fine, please do that if that's what you'd prefer to do. Um, once you finish this work, don't forget guys that the Dropbox link is at the bottom of the YouTube video so you guys can then go there and upload any of the work that you've done, okay? So I'm gonna walk you through this first example because we're gonna look at how we might defeat a boss. Um, so uh, at the moment, um, it's a little bit older, uh, a bit of a more uh, adult game that I'm playing at the moment called uh, Sekiro, uh, Shadows Die Twice. Uh, this is essentially the most difficult computer game I've ever played in my life. And uh, it's taken me a good few hours just to get past the first level. Um, and this practice of actually breaking down how you might defeat a boss is actually specifically useful in that game. Um, however, um, absolutely, this would apply to any computer game you're playing in which you get stuck on a difficult boss. Okay, And we can look at the different factors or, or assets that enable us to potentially defeat this boss properly, okay? So what I'm gonna do, guys, is say, okay, to defeat a boss, uh, we've got a number of different things that we can talk about uh, going forwards. Um, what I'm gonna start with, guys, is we can list only the things that are important to us. So what I'd like us to do is abstract us from anything that is unimportant with defeating this boss. We don't need to talk about the level design or the scenery in this boss battle, unless it permits and is important for that particular boss battle, okay? Now, if I was to talk about uh, Bowser uh, from Mario 64, uh, essentially all you had to do is run behind Bowser, grab his tail, swing him around and chuck him into a bomb, okay? Whilst also dodging his fire and flames and him jumping and rocking the scenery. So what we've got, guys, with any boss battle is a group of threats. Yeah, and for example, in that particular boss battle, we had the threats of fire. Uh, we had a shifting platform. And uh, we had Bowser himself, that was a deadly uh, touch character. If you touch Bowser anywhere other than on the tail, uh, he was actually a threat himself, okay? So these threats are things that we have to be understanding of, and we're gonna to come to this last uh, idea shortly, but we need to begin the idea of pattern recognition. When does Bowser blow fire? When does the platform shift and in what direction? When are you most likely to be actually uh, touched by Bowser and therefore damaged or lose lives as a result of that action. Moving on to this side, if we've got threats on the one side, what people in business often talk about with threats is also opportunities. So what were the opportunities uh, when fighting Bowser from Mario 64? And you can apply this to any boss battle that you've uh, gone through. Uh, well, perhaps, one of the opportunities was after the fire breath, um, Bowser was stunned. Didn't make a big enough box. Perhaps you do your text before you do your boxes, guys. Um, so after Bowser would breathe fire, he would actually then try and catch his breath for a few seconds, giving Mario the opportunity to go and grab his tail. Uh, what other opportunities were there? Well, in the environment, there were these bombs or mines on the edges of the arena. That you could throw Bowser into. And if you uh, shot that accurately and threw Bowser into one of these bombs, uh, he would come back stunned or hurt. And you'd only have to repeat this a certain number of times. So. What we've done here is just applied the model of decomposition just to a very, very simple example to begin with. And there's no specific way that I have to go about this. I chose to look at the threats and opportunities of defeating this boss, but that's not the only way you could do it. You can do it any way that makes sense to you. As long as you're thinking about all these 
minimal things at the bottom that enable you to really think logically about how you can solve this problem to defeat this boss, okay? Now, in a moment, I'm going to ask you guys to do that on perhaps another boss, but I'm going to give you a few more ideas as well for those people that play uh, less video games and therefore uh, might not have a particular boss in mind that they'd like to do a decomposition for saving, uh, for, for defeating that particular boss or enemy within a computer game, okay? So let's have a think about a more practical real world problem that we've got. How about uh, the idea that we want to save up for the PS5 when that releases, uh, just before Christmas? Or, of course, sorry guys, I must say as well, um, <coughs> the Xbox as well. But obviously, I know most of us are going to be saving up for the new PlayStation. Uh, typically, it has better exclusives on the console anyway, guys, than it does on the, on, than the Xbox does historically. But... Whatever your favorite console is, perhaps you're going to be saving up for one come Christmas or at least uh, behaving so that your parents consider getting you one for Christmas as well. What is involved in saving for a PS5? OK, what actual things are we going to have to do in order to make sure that when that PS5 releases, we can buy it? And this is a real thing for me. OK, this is a real thing that I'm going to have to try and justify, justify with the wife, but also work out how I can save enough money to purchase a PS5 when it comes out. I imagine it's going to be around the £500 mark. So my overall goal or objective is saving for a PS5. Now, again, guys, it doesn't have to be saving for a PS5. It could be saving for anything that you want to do. Perhaps you want to go on a holiday. Uh, perhaps you want to save for a new iPhone or a new smartphone. Uh, it could be for a computer or a tablet. It could be anything like that, anything expensive that requires some actual problem solving to think about how you could start saving for it, okay? So one of the biggest enemies of saving for anything uh, is spending. If you continue to spend, you are going to struggle to save. Um, so what types of things do I spend my money on that I can stop doing? Uh, I can stop buying games. OK, on the PlayStation Store, I can stop buying games that look good. I can just simply play the ones I've got for the time being whilst I save money by stop buying games. Um, now, because I run a household and I'm in charge of uh, uh, with my wife of, of the things that we purchase for, for us and our children, for example, I can save money on the shop. To be honest, that's not a viable solution. The wife definitely wouldn't let me save money on the shop and then put that towards a PlayStation 5 uh, pot of, of money. But in theory, that could that could help. Uh, what other things do I personally spend my money on? I can uh, stop buying clothes. OK, so these things I can stop with regards to my spending. What, what other uh, facets of this problem are there? Well, it's not just a matter of spending. It's a matter of, uh, you know, how do I save? Or how much do I save? Well, the PS5 comes out, in a, let's just say, in approximately five months. Uh, if it comes out in five months, uh, that's going to be approximately 20 weeks. Uh, five months would be £100 per month, and four weeks in each month would be £25 per week I'd have to try and save in order to get this or perhaps i've already got 300 pound in my account saved up for it maybe i could contribute that or also uh maybe this it would help if i sell my current ps4 could i do that well i've looked online i could probably sell it with a few of the games uh, for 200 pound. So actually, if I could take my 300 pound that I've already got and add that to a potential of 200 pound that I could sell my current PS4 for, it looks like I'll be there as far as saving for a PS5 is concerned. I'll probably actually have to stop buying games as well because I'll end up just chipping into that money. Or I could keep my PS4 uh, so that I can play the current games I've still got and then just save 25 pounds per week if possible. OK, but again, guys, you're taking something which is a large task and breaking it down into smaller subsections, which are easier to achieve. And I don't even need to try to achieve all of them. Perhaps I don't do these things, but overall, I still manage to solve my problem. 
The final example I'd like to talk through, guys, is one that's a hell of a lot more uh, practical or to do with real life. And what we're going to look at at the final example, guys, is how can we apply decomposition to getting good grades at school? Now, for those of you that enjoy school, and I imagine we've got a good pool of people here that are wanting to get themselves involved in a summer school, uh, that also share a lot of interest in those people that want to do uh, well at school and get themselves as many opportunities after school as they can anyway. But what is actually involved in getting good grades at school? Because as a teacher, I spend a lot of time teaching my um, computing or math students how to be good at maths or computing. But how much time do I actually take to discuss with them you know, the overall task of getting good grades. Or just getting a good education, okay? Depends on how much you, how much importance you place on the grades themselves. Maybe you just want to learn. How do you do that? What assets or elements are involved in getting good grades? Now, lots of you straight away will reach for the idea that you should be intelligent to get good grades. Oh, it helps. As a teacher, I can tell you that I've met lots of intelligent students. Um, I'm just going to say be smart. Yeah, that helps. Absolutely. If you've got a brain that absorbs information like a sponge, fantastic. That helps. But that's not the only element, guys. And I've seen plenty of good brains uh, not get good grades. Um, fundamentally, uh, it's got a lot to do with your attitude, isn't it? Now, it's horrible to be told you need to fix your attitude, something that I hate hearing myself. Well, what does it mean? Well, we can break down and have a think about what that potentially means. You think, guys, what else? Behaviour? Does your behaviour impact on whether you're going to get good grades or not? Are behaviour and attitude linked? Perhaps they are. <clears throat> and I'm going to say that one of the core components of, uh, of achieving in any environment, but schooling being one of them, um, is organization. One of the things I lacked as a young person was organization. I had a good attitude, I behaved when I could, and uh, I was relatively smart, I've had a good brain in my head, but organization is something I severely lacked whilst at school. So maybe this is something that I could have looked at to focus on. Now, I don't want to continue on that for any longer, guys. I don't want to continue on making uh, more and more different uh, uh, different kind of decompositions of how we can uh, look at solving problems. But what I'd like you to do, uh, perhaps for just the next five minutes, is to think of um, perhaps a boss from a computer game. Uh, perhaps I'd like you to think of a, a particular real-life event, like saving up for a PlayStation. Um, getting good grades at school, achieving something for your local football team, uh, doing something nice for someone in your family. Any of these things, can you think about doing a piece of work right now for the next five minutes? <clears throat> I'm gonna give you just over five minutes for this. Can you do a title box at the top of a potential problem that you would like to solve? That can even be a more abstract problem, for example, of looking at how to create world peace or uh, infinitely sustainable energy. But can you draw at the top a problem that you would like to solve? Below that, have a think of all of the high level things that would contribute to helping to solve that problem. And for each of those, what smaller things within those would contribute to helping to solve that sub problem? And are there sub problem solutions for those sub problems? Are there then a group of manageable things that you can do to make a positive impact on saving a, uh, solving a problem in a computer game like a boss or a puzzle, on developing or designing a computer game like Super Mario, or on any real world problem like saving some money or doing well at school? I'm going to just leave this on the screen for the time being with my decomposition of Super Mario and just give you five minutes. So really just up until half past 10, just to on your paper with your pen, work through on providing a decomposition on one of those things, but anything that you really fancy doing. Okay. <clears throat> and take this opportunity guys on Menti to log in, <clears throat> enter the code 30, 5864 
uh, which will be up on your screen in a second again. Make sure you log in with your name and the name of your school. And then, uh, then before you, please do that before you then go onto the link on the bottom of the YouTube uh, video to upload your stuff onto Dropbox. Okay, but now I'm going to leave you in peace and let you do this activity for about five minutes. Okay. Okay, guys, so I've not given you quite five minutes to do that task. However, uh, I do want to push on because we've only got 15 more minutes of the session. Um, you are able to continue that task after this session is complete and then upload that onto the Dropbox if possible, guys. But I'd love, absolutely love to see those uploaded so that I can uh, have a review of the different problems you guys want to tackle and the ways of which you've looked at decomposing those problems in order to solve them. But remember, guys, that these principles and these skills can apply anywhere in life, but absolutely apply to the gaming industry and des design and development of anything in computing as well. Uh, because computers can't solve large problems, they can only follow specific and small uh, instructions in a particular order, and therefore breaking these large problems down into small and specific tasks that can be completed is thinking computationally. It's taking something from a human or real world and breaking them down so that you can then 
add them into a computer that can solve that task for you. So something to think about, guys. Why is this computational thinking? Because by breaking tasks down, we can help them to fit into a computer. Okay. Now, coming back to the presentation, guys, we're going to look at the final out of the three aspects. We've looked at abstraction uh, and some fantastic artwork. I'm not sure if I'd describe Picasso as fantastic, but we've looked at art nonetheless. Um, and we've looked at how information can be hidden or taken away in order for us to better understand the problem at hand. Uh, one of the best examples of that being the London Underground map. OK, uh, we don't need to know where all the trees and buildings are. We just need to know the stations, directions, lines and their names. Now, having looked at decomposition, we can look at how to solve complex problems by breaking them down into smaller parts. Uh, the final thing that we'd like to look at today, guys, is pattern recognition. Now, pattern recognition, I made a note of it on my decomposition earlier. Um, and we find patterns amongst the smaller problems that we create, um, the similarities or characteristics that some problems share. It's one of the cornerstones, again, of computer science because it involves in finding the similarities amongst small or decomposed problems that can help us to solve problems more efficiently or more, more quickly. Um, what we're gonna do, guys, and this really does apply really well to the jigsaw problem for us, is um, you know, how can we look at problems that need to be uh, repeated or sections that share similarities? How can, pat how can pa pattern recognition help us? OK, and we do this all the time when you're looking at solving our problems or, or looking at puzzles to solve. You're looking at trying to find patterns and, and how do these things work in relationship to one another? OK, um, let's have a look at a actual concrete example, guys. And this is where I wanted us to kind of finish up today, which was on solving a jigsaw puzzle. We're going to apply uh, what we've learned about abstraction and decomposition, but we're also now going to start looking at how pattern recognition can be involved there and to help us how to solve a particular jigsaw puzzle as well. So starting with abstraction, guys, because what I've got here are three pieces of a particular puzzle. Um, and the reason this is abstracted, guys, is because I can figure out how to do this without even needing to know what is on that puzzle. It doesn't matter what image we have on that puzzle. Um, I can start solving this problem just by looking at the structure of these particular pieces. OK, so this is abstraction. I need not know what the puzzle's about or what the image is that the puzzle's displaying. I need only know at this point that I've got three different particular types of puzzle piece. I've got the corner. I've got the flat edge. And I've got the, the middle section or the, the piece where it's got four other connectors to it. So now how does that help us solve this problem? Well, if I can decompose the puzzle pieces to begin with into three different sections, I've got corners, edges and insides. There are properties about each of these different pieces, uh, which helps me dramatically to solve my problem. OK. I only ordinarily have four corner pieces okay because you have four corner pieces you know where those four pieces are going to go they're going to go in the four corners also because there's only four of them you can almost check them immediately against the overall picture of what you're trying to create and you can probably distinguish the position of which where all three of those go okay uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys uh, what this might look like in a real world example. Um, I've actually got one of my son's puzzles on the floor, um, but that's for two years. And uh, we haven't got two years to solve that puzzle together. Uh, what I'm going to do instead is just kind of draw what a puzzle might look like. And uh, we can have a look at how this helps us to solve the problem. So I've said that one of uh, by looking abstractly at the images or looking at least at uh, pattern recognition to a certain extent, uh, we've got this piece okay we've got this piece we have this piece and we have this piece now what does that mean for us like i said the four easiest pieces to find in your box because you can look at look at only the shapes of the actual puzzle pieces uh, the corners, we have four, and we can very quickly distinguish exactly where they need to go within the overall puzzle, okay? So, to solve a jigsaw puzzle, guys, my recommendation is uh, statistically, you're more likely to complete it quickly if you can locate, find the four pieces, and stick them into 
your puzzle. OK, so what is the next thing that we have to do? What's the next type of piece that we have to look at? Well, uh, now we've got these corner pieces, we might now want to start looking at the edge pieces. Now, why uh, is it good to look at the edge pieces? Well, because there's a few of them. There aren't, there's more than four normally, guys. There are normally more than four edge pieces, but there are still fewer edge, edge pieces than there are uh, central pieces. And for that reason, uh, we're then going to look at the edge pieces of this particular puzzle. So uh, the number of connections for each of those edge pieces as well is going to be only three different uh, pieces in total, which means for each edge piece, once you've connected one, you've only got to find two more connections for it. Uh, which gives you less work overall. Um, and I'd say that as far as difficulty is concerned, guys, uh, finding the edge pieces and connecting them onto your jigsaw puzzle is of a medium difficulty. It's not as easy as the corners, but it's most certainly not as difficult as the middle sections, okay? And when you see people solving jigsaw puzzles, uh, you often see that they've then gone straight for those edge pieces and tried to, tried to fill those in. I'm just gonna draw this very quickly, guys, or perhaps I'll draw this abstractly uh, because Time is an issue for me. We haven't got all day, but you know, you might find that you've made this much progress. You might find that you've done nearly an entire row at the top and you've managed to find all three of these pieces that all sit together in this area here. Uh, you might have then connected also some at the bottom and been able to get them into place. Okay, and perhaps one above on that corner. And got that one into place and eventually guys you will have if you've worked hard at it got all of your edge pieces into place and you'll have a lovely frame for which you can then continue to solve your puzzle on now what are the number of pieces of this well it's going to be the width um, of, your, of your puzzle uh, minus two uh, because we've got the entire width of this puzzle but minus the two corner pieces um, times by two because we've got the top and the bottom, uh, add the height of your puzzle, minus two pieces, uh, because you're not gonna count the corners, uh, times that by two because you've got two sides. So the number of pieces that we've got to solve here is actually still a lot, lot easier. And this may look complex guys, but it's just thinking about it logically. Um, We've got very much fewer pieces to find for these edges. And now what we've got, after we've done all of those edge pieces, is a beautiful frame to continue with, okay? Now we get to the hard bit, of which we've got the central pieces, okay? Now this can be uh, anywhere between, say, 20 pieces up to 200, 300, 400, 500 pieces I've seen. Uh, one of my best friends is still working on a puzzle that he's been working on for a long time, and you'll find it's all the central pieces that are a bit of a mess. Uh, essentially, he's built, he's um, purchased a puzzle which is essentially a forest. Uh, the whole thing looks the same, uh, and it's not something that I want to help him with. It's, it's, it doesn't look enjoyable to me, but he's enjoying it, so good for him. Now, just coming back and briefly looking at these inside pieces, uh, we have lots of them, okay? The number is vast. Uh, the number of connections for each of those pieces is four. Uh, that is difficult. We've got to find after connecting one, we have to find another three to connect it to. So the difficulty is hard, guys, okay? And this is where we're gonna move away from decomposition. We're gonna move away from abstraction and we're actually gonna start looking at the detail on these jigsaw puzzle pieces. We can use pattern recognition, guys, to start putting them into uh, piles. What you can see on the image on your screen is that for this particular puzzle, uh, we've separated all of the pieces of blue from all of the pieces of green and brown. Now, looking at more detail on these particular puzzle pieces, guys, we've got these blue ones, uh, you know, fundamentally, they could be sky, couldn't they? They look like they might be sky, which gives us another big clue. Uh, the sky will most likely be at the top of this puzzle. Uh, the location of those pieces will most likely go to the top. Uh, on the other pieces, we can see what might potentially be, uh, I've said, grassland because it's green. And typically in nature, we find that trees and grass are green, guys, and they tend to live on the, on the ground. So the grassland I can put into a big pile and say that those all go at the bottom half of this puzzle. And the sky pieces, uh, they all go together and they probably go at the top of this puzzle. Um, you'll then have a collection of pieces, guys, most likely that have got both green and blue on them. And they're likely going to be the horizon where the sky and the ground meet. 
What we've done now is use the principles of pattern recognition to actually match these pieces up together so that we can begin actually giving ourselves a chance of, of completing our puzzle. We can start putting them into our overall puzzle so that we can actually start solving this very, very difficult and complex problem. Now that I've got my two separate piles, I've got my green pile and my blue pile of puzzle pieces, I can start thinking about where in this very specific area here do all of my green pieces need to go? And where in this very specific area here do all my blue pieces need to go? Okay, there's less work to do. I'm not looking at doing a puzzle of 20 to 500 pieces anymore. I'm looking at doing a puzzle of between four to 100 pieces for this top section. And it makes the job much easier. Now, why does this matter? Why do you need to know how to solve a jigsaw puzzle? Well, in fact, guys, you do not. You do not need me to teach you how to solve a jigsaw puzzle. This is not going to help you break into the gaming industry. But what that will do, guys, is give you a set of tools in which you can apply to uh, any, any problem that you guys need to solve. It's not just unique for solving jigsaw puzzles. Okay, And that's what I hope that we got across today. Um, so to look at today's learning objectives and to be able to review whether we've met them or not, um, have we learned what computational thinking is? Well, I hope that I've got across that thinking computationally is breaking down that, that area or that gap between the way of which a human being thinks and the way that a computer works. By thinking computationally, we thought, think about solving problems in computational terms. Okay. Uh, what elements of that are there? Well, we've looked at decomposition, at breaking things down into small manageable pieces, or as far as programming is concerned, breaking things down into small specific instructions that we can turn into algorithms. Um, we've looked at abstraction and what information is unimportant to us, okay, when looking at, for example, a London underground map or the jigsaw puzzle. You know, finding those four original pieces for the corners and then looking at the edging doesn't really matter as much what the particular pattern is on that jigsaw piece. What's more important at that stage is separating those different pieces. And then finally, pattern recognition, guys, paying attention to the detail and looking at if that can help us to group things or break things down further into different areas so that we can then start to small solve smaller parts. This set of skills, guys, that we've gone through today is so important. I can teach my students how to program, but I can't always teach them how to solve problems computationally. If you guys can practice these methods of decomposition, abstraction, and pattern recognition in your own lives, you can help yourself towards solving problems anywhere in life, but also to begin to become a very powerful uh, designer of algorithms and programmer of computer games, okay? And finally, guys, we've looked at solving a jigsaw puzzle as an example of how these different skills can be applied. Uh, but again, please do take away from this session that these can be applied in any remit uh, and do not only apply for solving a jigsaw puzzle. Now, before I go, guys, I'd like to thank you again for joining me on this very hot Wednesday. Um, you've done fantastically. I hope to see some fantastic work. In order to see your fantastic work, guys, please don't forget to sign on to menti.com, which is in the bottom left of this uh, PowerPoint that you guys can see. Uh, put the code 30, first, uh, 5864 in so that you can uh, enter your name and your school name and then make any comments or questions that you've got from the session. Um, and then also, guys, once you've done that, please do not forget to perhaps photograph or take a copy of the digital work that you've produced if using paint or, or something like that. And to click on the link below the YouTube video so that you can upload that onto the Dropbox so that I'm able to see the piece of work that you've done uh, for solving your own more complex problem. Uh, I'd absolutely love to see that you guys have put some of these principles into practice and started to practice and develop those skills that are absolutely essential, not only in any uh, workforce today, but are absolutely essential in the gaming industry or computing industries as well. Uh, thank you very, very much for your time, guys. Any feedback is greatly appreciated and uh, have a lovely, lovely day. I'll leave this screen up. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much for that really, really interesting session, Michael. I know I've learned so much about how jigsaws work and how to make lots of, um, and how 
it's just been very, very interesting. So thank you so much. Can I ask everyone to go back onto Menti? We've got a small little poll to ask you about what you've learned in this session to let you know and what skills you've improved. So can you let us know on menti.com and the code is 305864. I'll leave the slide up so you'll be able to just let us know what skills you've improved in today's session. Session will start at 11.15 and it's maths with Iram and it's a really interesting and cool session so make sure you come back at 11.15 onto our YouTube channel to watch Iram um, do her math session. Thank you so much guys.